Hi guys, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you. Hello. All right. So, first of all, I just want to thank you all for uh, you know uh, showing up despite all the circumstances. Here's the room behind us. In case you guys are uh, um, you know getting a little uh, nostalgic about uh, the times when we could actually see each other and ask questions in person. So we're going to try uh, something uh, different today. So we're going to try uh, having an interactive opportunity for questions. So the way that we're going to be doing that is that you will be asking questions uh, using the chat function. And then our TAs will be responding on the, on the fly, basically getting your answers uh, right away whenever possible. And every now and then when I ask for questions, you will have the opportunity to sort of unmute and uh, repeat one of the questions that you had on chat or just ask me a question live or maybe the TAs will jump in and say, hey, we had a question on this topic or that topic. So uh, I'm going to share my screen and then we're going to go through it. And uh, the PDF of the slides is in the Dropbox. So hopefully the TAs will be sharing that soon. So today's lecture is on predicting uh, gene expression uh, using the deep learning models that we've learned about. Can you guys all see my screen? Can you see my pointer? Not if you yep. can. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Good. So uh, what's the goal? The goal is to sort of predict both gene expression and splicing. So just to recap, um, let's see how we go forward. Um, we uh, saw uh, various uh, ways of uh, studying gene expression last time. We basically looked at RNA-seq uh, with direct sequencing. We looked at uh, hybridization in microarrays. And we ended up with these massive gene expression matrices that basically measure the expression of, say, 20,000 genes in each condition. And then you can repeat this experiment in many, many different conditions. So, uh, the resulting gene expression matrix allows you to ask many types of questions. The first is, what is the expression profile of a gene looking like across different experiments along this dimension? The second one is, what is the expression pattern of one um, uh, gene uh, look, look, looks like across, sorry, that's one gene across different experiments. And this is one experiment across different genes. So you can basically start studying this matrix to, uh, to uh, recognize uh, modules of genes that are acting coordinately and that might be involved in similar processes, as well as modules of conditions. You can sort of cluster the conditions together. So you can basically do um, both clustering, which is de novo uh, discovery of these modules, as well as classification, where you know the classes already and you're searching for the set of features that allow you to predict that this gene plays a role in T cell activation or the set of features that allow you to predict that you know, this particular uh, condition is a cancerous sample rather than a um, healthy sample. And what we focused on uh, in the lecture on uh, Thursday uh, before, uh, before the unfortunate break, uh, was uh, the dimensionality reduction methods. So basically we looked at PCA of how we can basically take the expression patterns of these 20,000 dimensional vectors along the principal components of variation, and then rotate the space to understand what are these principal axes of variation. We saw how we can go beyond um, principal components uh, into SVD and basically learn about how we can transform these matrices through these rotation, scaling, and rotation operations of the decomposition of any of these matrices into their individual components, and how we could actually uh, use SVD as a means to do long, low rank approximations of these um, data sets. The idea here is that I can look at all 20,000 dimensions, but the actual true set of dimensions is actually much, much lower. So instead, what I can do is uh, learn, say, the 20-dimensional approximation of this 20,000-dimensional space into the basically 20 top principal components of variation or singular values, uh, if you wish, of variation here. And what we saw is that 
uh, SVD was allow allowing us to actually carry out such a low rank approximation simply by truncating the set of uh, non-zero singular values that we keep. So instead of using all of the singular values, we could actually show that this is provable that this is the optimal um, set of lower dimensional representations by simply truncating these uh, singular values after having sorted them, of course, by their order. And we saw how these methods apply to recognizing digits. For example, this is the principal component analysis of these MNIST digits. And here we're basically showing the two principal components of variation. So along this first principal component or this first uh, you know, dimension of variation, you basically see that the digit one is basically being very easily recognized from the digit zero. And you know, along the second dimension, you see that uh, seven is being recognized from two and so on and so forth. And then uh, at various values along these dimensions, you basically can see that you can now place all your digits. So we basically went from these 256 times 256 dimensional vector into just a two dimensional vector that basically captures the differences between these digits. And then we saw a variation of uh, this approach where we can now uh, project all these data into lower dimensional embeddings. And in particular, these uh, T-SNE uh, approximations of these very, very high dimensional distances into a much lower dimensional space. In this particular case, again, a two dimensional space. And we saw how T-SNE is in fact capturing this local pairwise distance of all of these um, individual data points, each of them being an image, and uh, how at the local level, it is basically capturing these distances, but at the global level, it is separating the points as much as possible in space. And this is basically a major workhorse in uh, the study of gene expression. So this is work from our own lab, looking at uh, you know, various Disney um, plots, uh, and other variations of uh, TSNE. That's basically looking at tens of thousands of individual cells. Every single dot is a 20,000 dimensional vector that basically tells us the expression of 20,000 genes in that one cell, in that one um, person. So basically this is looking at 84,000 cells across 48 different individuals and now enabling us using these techniques that we saw uh, last, uh, last, at the last lecture, using these techniques to now start distinguishing different cell types and to also start disting distinguishing Alzheimer's neurons from non-Alzheimer's neurons just based on their gene expression patterns. And you can do the same thing for schizophrenia and bipolar, for different sub-regions of the brain, for different uh, large regions of the brain. This is sub-regions of the hippocampus. And uh, what you can see is just how powerful these approaches are in sort of taking this very, very high dimensional data and then clustering it down into a small set of highly distinct clusters with a huge amount of meaning and also aesthetically pleasing pictures that you can now put in your living room. The last thing we saw last time was how we can actually take these very, very high dimensional data and reduce its dimensionality through a bottleneck in a deep learning model that takes the original input and then predicts the same output from the same input through a bottleneck in the layer complexity that effectively forces the model to learn lower dimensional representations. So that's where we're starting today. We basically are now building on what we learned about last uh, time with uh, looking at not just unsupervised learning, but now supervised learning. So uh, instead of just learning these clusters of gene expression, what we'd like to do is actually start predicting gene expression systematically and also predicting splicing. For example, we're gonna look at how we can upsample a thousand measurements of gene expression into 20,000 measurements of gene expression. So instead of building a microarray that measures every gene in the genome, I can just measure, build a microarray that measures only a thousand genes. And from that, upscale to 20,000 measurements. We then will look at how we can use compressive sensing to go beyond individual gene by gene measurements to composite measurements, both from a theoretical perspective and from a experimental practical perspective. 
Then we're going to look at models that allow you to now start predicting the value of expression uh, of a particular gene from its chromatin state. And then we're going to start looking at how we can predict splicing from sequence directly using thousands of features in these deep learning models. And then we're going to switch to uh, unsupervised deep learning models. We're going to introduce restricted Boltzmann machines. They're a very powerful form of deep learning that actually does not require any kind of training set. And then we're going to look at how we can uh, do multimodal integration across expression, DNA, microRNAs, using these restricted Boltzmann machines. So let's jump right in. How do we upsample 1,000 genes into 20,000 genes? This is by no new means a new problem. In the field of digital signal uh, processing, upscaling has been uh, studied for many, many decades. The concept is the following. I have a signal that has been sampled, say, only every one second. And then what I'm trying to do is infer what was the intermediate of that signal if I want to play a voice very slowly or if I want to sort of capture additional features of that original signal. And if it's a linear signal, if it's a constant signal, it's very easy to interpolate. You can basically say, well, I can just take that middle point to be, you know, whatever, you know, uh, lies in between. So if I'm three quarters between six and seven, well, I'll just take the average or three quarters weighted between them. And then same thing here in a sort of linear plot. It becomes more challenging where the function is, you know, nonlinear. And that's where uh, sort of things get more interesting. That's where you need to figure out lower dimensional representations of your data in order to actually be able to uh, carry out this uh, upscaling. The typical approach in digital signal uh, processing is an interpolating low pass filter, which I'm showing here, which basically creates these finite impulse responses and sort of allows you to sort of capture in this lower dimensional representation uh, this high dimensional signal and effectively be able to infer these intermediate positions up to some limitations, which are given theoretically by the Nyquist rate in the discrete uh, domain or the Nyquist frequency in the continuous domain. So this is for traditional signal processing. More recently, there's been a massive amount of interest in sort of using upscaling for images. So here's one example. You have a low resolution image and you'd like to convert it into a high resolution image. <laughs> this sounds almost impossible. And, uh, you know, it should be quite puzzling that this is even possible. But how is that possible? Well, first of all, your eye kind of does that. Basically, when you're seeing a lower dimensional representation, your eye is naturally inferring that this image is probably coming from a high resolution version and can probably infer that this is, you know, a finger and should probably continue this way and so on and so forth. So the information is there in the image and at least it is interpretable by your own you know, visual system and cognitive uh, abilities. But how does a computer do that? Well, let's look at the inverse problem. How do we go from this to that, right? So how do we downsample images? We can downsample images by basically taking, I don't know, nine pixels at a time, and then inferring the average of those nine pixels, and then outputting that value over there. Everybody with me so far? So uh, that basically means that we can now start um, uh, asking, well, what are these operations that carry out the downsampling? And can I perhaps reverse these operations to do upsampling? So the operations that carry down the downsampling are basically convolution operations. These are operations that we saw before quite extensively, where you're basically looking at nine pixels at a time and then convolving them using a max or a sum operation into a single value. Now, the, the inverse problem is much harder. It's basically what are the set of nine values that could have led to this operation? And if you did this at a single scale, this would be impossible because the information is simply not there to, to, to parse it out. But when you do this at multiple scales, when you do these convolutional la uh, layers that are stacked, where at every layer you're learning more and more information from the context of multiple surrounding pixels, then you can kind of see how this is becoming possible. The way that you can do this is by basically asking 
what is the set of values for this nine by nine grid or this three by three nine pixel grid that are compatible not just with the current layer that I'm on but with multiple layers and you could do this in isolation by basically sort of first learning all these multiple layers in the, this particular image to sort of learn patterns of this image or you could do this in a corpus of images so you can basically train it on ImageNet and sort of build a set of relationships between these different layers that allows you to now start carrying out transfer learning from the corpus of images to your next individual image that you're thinking about. So the problem that we're trying to solve is a lower dimensional reprojection of whatever we've learned from this corpus of images. We've basically taken this super high dimensional corpus of images. We've learned a lower dimensional representation of that. And what we can do simply is reproject this lower dimensional representation to a higher dimensional image in the same way that we saw with the autoencoder that I, would, I could clamp it through a lower dimensional representation and then reproject it out to a higher dimensional representation. In this particular case, what we're doing is basically taking this image, projecting it down into a lower dimensional representation, then rescaling it back up to a higher dimensional representation where this lower dimensional representation is constrained by the types of convolutions and the types of filters that we have learned in our corpus of images. Who's with me so far? Raise your hand if you guys are with me. Awesome. I see a lot of faces nodding. <laughs> Thank you. This is awesome. So in the space of images, this is basically achieved by taking this very large image file and in the same way that we were compressing it before and then you know, re-decompressing it after in this particular example of this uh, U-net that, uh, that, that I think you saw before uh, in this course, we can basically compress and then re-upscale and then denoise through that. And then again, this is very similar to this autoencoder bottleneck where you go from high dimension to lower dimensional to high dimensional. But the modification here is that we're actually doing the decompression and upscaling by starting with the low dimension directly and then moving on to the high dimension from that. And there have been many different architectures that allow you to do that. You can basically use residual networks. You can use recursive learning. You can use attentional uh, learning that we're going to talk about later in this lecture. You can use these dense connections that sort of take you across jumps of layers to enable training similar to ResNet, but now with more than just um, you know, one hop over the existing layers with multiple hops. You could do multiple paths or scale specific multipath learning or convolve groups of information at a time or sort of build these pyramidal structures. And you could also do this super resolution by either pre-sampling your image by first upsampling and then building the convolutional layers to increase the resolution of this upsampled image, or by first having your convolutional layers and then upsampling after you've learned that representation, or by progressively upsampling uh, in sort of multiple stages where you have several convolutions, you're learning representations at this scale, and then you're upsampling. You're learning more, more lower dimensional representations of this uh, upsampled image and then you're up sampling again. Or you could actually carry out iterative up and down sampling, where you're basically learning these representations by upscaling, reprojecting down, re-upscaling, reprojecting down, and so on and so forth. Who's feeling that, they've learned, that they're sort of getting it so far? Yeah? Awesome. So this is now the way that upscaling has typically been done in um, images. Uh, but today we're talking about gene expression measurements. How do we basically measure the expression of a very small subset of genes and then upscale this to a very large number of genes? In particular, there's this Lynx um, uh, database that has basically built this set of 1,000 genes called the L1000, which have been profiled across millions of conditions. So basically thousands of compounds have been applied to them, thousands of different perturbations, thousands of uh, you know, knockout measurements, uh, many, many different cancer cell lines, 
And all of that has basically led to this massive, massive database of these same set of a thousand genes measured over and over again across many different conditions. What we'd like to do now is basically take these measurements and then upscale them. We'd like to actually predict the expression of every gene in the genome from the set of 1,000 measurements. Is everybody with me so far? Raise your hands if you're with me. Awesome. Good. Um, so that basically means that we can now start um, applying the same kind of insight to do this. And uh, first, we're going to do that with a set of single gene measurements. And then we're going to extend this to composite measurements. So instead of sort of worrying about, hey, which 1,000 genes should I measure, we're going to figure out ways of actually doing composite measurements of 1,000 measurements, each of which is a combination of multiple genes. So you can now start measuring combinations of genes as a form of compressed sensing, and then better capture the high dimensional vector where these measurements are coming from. So how do we do that? So uh, one approach has been uh, taken by Xia Weixie, who's actually an alum from uh, MIT uh, and his students, looking at gene expression inference with deep learning from this L1000 data set. How? By basically building this deep learning architecture where you're uh, carrying out a multitask, multi-layer, feed-forward neural network. So you're starting with a thousand landmark genes. These are the L1000 genes. And then you're trying to predict the expression of 9,520 target genes, which have been partitioned into two halves because they needed to fit it in memory back in 2015. So the idea is that you're gonna basically build these 3,000 hidden units, each of which is gonna be learning a combination of these landmark genes, and each of which is gonna be predicting some nonlinear function for the output of 5,000 genes. Raise your hands if you're with me so far. If the problem makes sense, awesome. So what are the model parameters? The model parameters are basically, um, they've tried having one, two, or three hidden layers, various dropout rates, varying the momentum coefficient, varying the initial learning rate, varying the minimum learning rate and learning rate decay, the learning scale, the mini batch size, the training epoch, and then uh, different initial weights. And the architecture is basically very simple. It's basically saying, how do we take all these combinations and then predict those, um, uh, those target genes from a set of much smaller landmark genes? So let's see how it performs. So if you look at this comparison with um, linear regression shown here, or its comparison with k-nearest neighbor shown here, you can see that the minimum uh, average error is actually much, much smaller. So basically you can see that it is outperforming individual methods. But this is the overall distribution of genes, what about of errors across genes. What about the uh, individual per gene measurement? So that's what you see here. Again, you see that this deep learning approach is basically showing consistently lower error than linear regression and significantly lower error than k nearest neighbor. And you can see here how it performs across different training epoch and how the training very rapidly converges uh, to uh, lower error than these competing methods. And uh, again, you can see here the result of using one, two, or three set of hidden layers. And you can see that the error is in fact continuing to decrease with those. So this is basically great. It's basically surpassing uh, previous methods. It's enabling us to use these deep learning architectures that we've learned about to now start upscaling gene expression measurements. And it's um, you know, uh, very uh, actually useful in inferring many, many measurements from a set of much smaller measurements. But the challenge, of course, is that the performance is still not that great, namely um, you know, having a Overall error of 0.3 is, you know, not, not that great. And there were also computational limitations that basically forced them to separate it into two. But this is a field that's, again, ripe for the reaping if you guys are interested in sort of final projects using deep learning to predict gene expression from various features. 
I would really encourage you to look into this space. So this was looking at 1,000 individual genes. So first of all, let me pause here and see if there's uh, any questions so far. So uh, looking at the chat window, um, how do I interpret these errors? What does an error of 0 0.3 mean? So this is basically 30% uh, inaccurate. So basically, if you're asking what was the actual value of that error, uh, of that gene, you're basically off by a, by a, a third, a factor of 0.3. Any other questions? You guys can unmute and speak if you want, or you can just type them in. Who's following so far? Yeah, awesome, good. So uh, this was now looking at just 1,000 genes. What about uh, going beyond this single gene uh, view? How do we make composite measurements? And at first it sounds a little crazy, like what are you guys going to do? But I'll actually show you a very practical way of actually building these probes experimentally. But the idea is the following. The idea is instead of measuring individual genes at a time, perhaps the true expression uh, pattern is in fact um, much more easily sampled through modules of me through modules, through measurement that capture the true underlying modules of genes. Let me explain. Instead of sampling one gene at a time, and then using this one gene to infer the expression of many, many other genes. What I'm going to be sampling is uh, one measurement here that only captures one gene, one measurement here that captures positively this one gene and negatively this other gene. Another you know, measurement here that basically me measures this combination of three genes, this combination of four genes, and so on and so forth. Is everybody with me here? So instead of measuring individual genes at a time, where one gene might end up belonging in multiple modules, so when I measure that you know, uh, single gene here, I don't actually know whether I'm measuring this module or that module. Maybe I could construct a set of modules, a set of module-driven measurements that allow me to now capture combinations of uh, properties and combinations of uh, genes. So the idea is the following. Instead of using uh, singular value decomposition or instead of using SMARS NMF, you're gonna be basically learning a set of genes, gene combinations that I should be measuring using this sparse module activity factorization. And then the goal of that is to have a relatively small number of active modules that I'm measuring in every sample that I'm making and uh, you know, relatively small uh, effective number of uh, genes for these modules. So applying this sparse module factorization algorithm that basically initializes uh, these you know, large matrices and then updates the module uh, dictionary, normalizes these modules, and then updates the activity uh, levels of these modules. You basically can now start learning combinations of these um, uh, measurements that one should be making and inferring a much more informative set of um, predictions for each of those modules. So the idea is that the L1000 certainly captures gene expression with maybe an error of 30%, but perhaps we can improve it. Perhaps we can actually capture some of those modules that are not necessarily captured by doing the same number of measurements, but now partitioning these measurements in a way that captures you know, many more modules. So if you look at the total number of enriched gene sets divided by the number of modules, you basically see that this approach here of uh, SMAF or sparse module activity factorization is greatly outperforming either SPD or sparse NMF by basically encoding this very high dimensional vector in a lower dimensional space. So uh, any questions so far on this? Let me see the chat. How do you decide to group genes for the, how to group genes for these composite measurements? Would you do something like GSEA and group genes into families? Yes, absolutely. So basically the way that you do this is that you're effectively doing uh, any kind of partitioning using NMF, SVD, uh, SMAF, any sort of partitioning of genes into modules, and then learning the measurements that best capture that set of modules. Any other questions? Who's with me so far? Raise your hands if you're following. Yes, some timid hands. Uh, I can see you guys <laughs> tell me if you're following. Uh, I see smiles, but not, not too much hate, uh, shaking. Uh, 
So this is a quite advanced topic, I have to say, but the idea, again, should be quite simple, namely, instead of measuring individual genes, I'm gonna be measuring combinations of the genes that are directly driven by the set of modules that exist. So instead of just measuring, you know, uh, one gene that is involved in multiple modules, I'm now gonna measure these three genes that is quite uniquely defining this module and these other three genes that is uniquely defining that module and these other five genes that is uniquely defining that other module effectively getting a module wise measurement of the overall gene expression spectrum. Does that help explain things more? Yes, no? Let me see uh, more faces because I'm only looking at a small subset uh, at a time. Well, the small subset are the folks who have their camera on. So thank you guys for keeping your cameras on because it's very helpful to be able to see your, uh, your expressions. So who's with me so far? Are you guys with me? Yes, we have no? one more question yeah, from Karthik. Oh, we have one more question. Let me check. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, is modern interchangeable with gene set? Yeah, kind of. I, I try to use gene set when we're talking about sort of previously defined and well annotated groups of genes that have a common function, whereas module is a little more general and it sort of has more of the connotation of the novel learning of common patterns of expression and common patterns of behavior. So I, I'm using the word module to um, reflect the de novo learned set of genes. But yes, it is a gene set but it is learned from the data rather than given to us from uh, you know, the gene ontology annotation team. Any other questions? All right. <clears throat> so if we could only, oh, see, I have one more question. Um, that's just me. That's, that's just me. That's just me. question <laughs> in the original paper that used mean absolute error between predicted expression and measured expression from microarray. Uh, that's just the TA responding. <laughs> uh, it's an answer. It's still worth uh, reading out loud. Um, all right. So we basically now have the ability to sample individual modules by capturing signature genes that define these modules rather than one gene at a time and then inferring the modules after the fact. But the next question is, well, how do we go about actually measuring combinations of genes? There, you know, such a technology has never been built before. How do you measure uh, two thirds of gene A and one third of gene B plus, you know, seven times gene C? So the way that you can do that is by basically building probes that within them contain combinations of these uh, genes. So if I want to measure, for example, gene, um, uh, a, B, C, D, E, F in a single composite measurement, then what I could do is basically build a hybridization probe in my microarray uh, design that has probes that are complementary to each of these genes. So basically I'm building a set of composite measurements that allow me to now capture the you know gene a um you know three times by building three probes against gene a and gene b two times by building two probes against gene b so when gene a is expressed at a level of 10 then i'm capturing a combination of those according to the number of probes that i have and a combination of b and a combination of c effectively giving me a composite measurement that allows me to now capture uh these modules more directly so I can build combinations of probes and combinations of barcodes for measurement. And these allow me to have, you know, better signal to noise ratios. These allow me to have better capture of these uh, modules and sort of overall better uh, properties overall. Uh, raise your hands if you're with me on the experimental side of sort of how I could actually go and design those. You guys see that? Awesome. Very cool. So basically, instead of having a single measurement in my well, I now have multiple probes across combinations of genes, which are weighed and scaled according to the weights that I want for each of those genes. And that's what sort of allows me to carry all this out. So we've basically looked at how we can um, carry out upsampling 
of predicting 20,000 genes from 1,000 genes, how we can carry out compressive sensing and build composite measurement to infer modules more directly from combinations of genes. Let's now turn into how do we predict gene expression directly from uh, chromatin. So uh, let's look specifically at deep architectures and also these memory attention models that we looked with long short-term memories to basically predict gene expression from chromatin. So what is the problem? The problem is we have a lot of histone modification marks or DNA expression and, or sorry, DNA methylation, and we'd like to use that to predict uh, RNA expression. The uh, underlying data set is the roadmap epigenomics uh, data, which basically has measured across 127 uh, cell types and tissue types, a large number of histone modification marks, DNA methylation, DNA accessibility, um, and also gene expression level. So for each of those uh, conditions, you can basically say, well, what is the average DNA methylation level as I walk along the body of the gene from the transcription start site to the transcription end site? And what you can see is that for the genes that have the highest expression, shown in red here, the DNA methylation is lowest at the promoter, but highest in the body of the gene, much higher than for the genes that are not expressed. So you see here that it actually crosses out. So that basically means that there's a positional relationship between DNA expression, sorry, between DNA methylation and RNA expression levels. So that basically means that as I walk along the body of the gene, I can't simply say, hey, what is the overall methylation? Because I'll be averaging out regions such as the promoter region, the gene regulatory regions where low DNA methylation means less repression and more expression versus regions that are transcribed where more uh, methylation actually means more expression. So the, the relationship is inverted. So that means that I need to build positional models that capture information from different positions along the body of the gene. Raise your hands if you're with me so far. Yes? Awesome. So how do we do that? We can basically, uh, actually let's go a step beyond that. So this is DNA methylation versus gene expression levels. Let's now look at the relationship between these histone modification marks and gene expression levels. So histone uh, H3, lysine 4, monomethylation, is usually associated with poised enhancers. When you combine that mark with K27 acetylation, it's something that we called the strong enhancer um, or active enhancer. And then you have promoter marks, transcribed marks, et cetera. So each of these marks is telling us something different about each position along the body of the gene. Let's see how they vary with expression. <clears throat> Sorry. Δεν μπορώ να μιλήσω τώρα, διδάσκω. Θα είμαι ελεύθερο σε μία ώρα περίπου. Ευχαριστώ. This is national TV in Greece and they're calling me because they want to put me on to talk about the coronavirus. <laughs> so I apologize. They're going to stress out if I don't uh, pick up. So how do we do that? We basically um, want to look at the relationship again between gene expression levels and these combinations of histone modification marks. Mm. So in this particular case, Πραγματικά δεν μπορώ να μιλήσω τώρα. Καλησπέρα Δεν μπορώ να μιλήσω τώρα. Θα είμαι ελεύθερο. Θα είμαι ελεύθερο στην ώρα που είπαμε. Σε μία ώρα είπαμε. Δεν μπορώ τώρα να μιλήσω. Παρακαλώ, έχουμε ραντεβού σε μία ώρα. Τώρα διδάσκω μέχρι τις δύο και μισή. Για ακόμα 45 λεπτά διδάσκω. Δεν μπορώ να μιλήσω τώρα. <laughs> he had no sound, so he, he couldn't tell what I was saying. Sorry. Um, all right. So, and by the way, if that's all Greek to you, yes, that was all Greek. Um, so, um, we basically have the ability to now start looking at the relationship across all of these different uh, tissues for what are the genes that have strong enhancers versus the genes that have weak enhancers, namely H3K4 monomethylation plus H3K27 acetylation. Uh, 
And what you can see is this higher level of overall expression when you have both marks, lower level of expression when you only have one mark, and almost no expression when you have no mark. This is kind of cool, right? It basically says that, yes, there should be information in the combination of histone modification marks that allows us to predict the level of gene expression. You can do this quantitatively by basically partitioning the genes into uh, four quadrants, the highest, uh, second, third, and lowest um, expression levels, and then ask, well, in each of these uh, different reference epigenomes, uh, what is the proportion of genes that have strong enhancers or weak enhancers or no enhancers nearby? And again, you can see that the proportion of strong enhancers increases dramatically for the genes that have higher expression, and then the proportion with no marks decreases drama increases dramatically as you go to the genes with lowest expression. Raise your hands if you're with me so far. Yeah, awesome. So can we now start building models that allow us to not only classify the genes, but actually predict the actual expression levels of those genes? And that's what this deep Chrome uh, deep learning architecture actually built. So this is by uh, Yang Jun uh, Chi and collaborators, where uh, they basically built a deep learning model for predicting gene expression from histone modifications and applied it specifically to these um, epigenomes that I have been describing. So how does the model work? The model basically has a different track for every histone mark and different bins of 100 base pairs for the overall activity level of that mark as I walk along the body of the gene. So the transcription start side is here and then downstream of the transcription start side, I have histone uh, H3K36 methylation. Then exactly on the body, I have histone H3, uh, K4 uh, trimethylation. And then upstream, I can have histone H3, K27 acetylation or H3, K4, ME1, and so on and so forth. So how do we now uh, include all of these features together to basically predict the expression of the gene? Well, the architecture is again, very classical. It's the kind of stuff that you guys have seen before. It's a set of convolutional layers a set of pooling layers, a set of dropout layers, and then a multi-layer perception with, a set, with an alternating set of linear versus non-linear values uh, with the final output of a plus one or a minus one for whether this particular gene might be expressed or no. And then the quantitative value of that can basically um, tell us about the overall level of expression. Is everybody with me on this architecture? So basically you start with all of these different inputs across the many different marks. You basically build these convolutions that allow you to now use combination of these marks at different positions and sort of uh, combine these data together. And then you have these max pooling layers that allow you to uh, capture that, yes, that particular combination was found somewhere in the vicinity of that gene, even if it's not exactly at the same location. This layer here gives us the positional invariance uh, of this particular combination of marks. And the combinations of vectors here in this convolution looking at multiple marks across the same positions allows us to now capture this particular pattern of occurrences of these marks, even if it's shifted, uh, as long as these marks maintain this, their relative positions relative to each other. Raise your hands if you're with me so far. Yes, awesome, very cool. So we now have uh, all these features, we're extracting from these features combinations that we are then pushing onto the higher layer, layers and then building these multi-layer uh, perception uh, input that is then uh, utilized across uh, the entire um, um, feature. So we can now ask, how does this perform across these uh, different cell types? And how does that compare with say singular uh, value analysis, uh, using averaging or best bin, sorry, uh, and um, RFC, so just three different uh, methods. So as you basically scan across the different epigenomes and the different samples and tissues, you basically see that deep chrome is outperforming consistently all of these other methods. Again, showing uh, you know, an, a an AUC of up to 90% for some of the cell types, and then you know, between 70 and 80% for many of the cell types. So how does that work? We basically now can see what are genes that are highly expressed 
and what are genes that are lowly expressed and what are the features that they're utilizing across this set of input features. And what you'll notice, for example, is that for genes that have high expression, they're utilizing much less features that are associated with polycomb repression, like H3K27 trimethylation. But genes that have low expression are utilizing these features much more. So the activation vectors flowing back down to these individual histone modification marks are in fact much more frequent. And you can see here the overall frequency of utilization of these different marks, where you can see that for the low expression genes, the highest uh, activations are found for H3K27 trimethylation, a mark of polycomb repression, and H3K9 trimethylation, a mark of um, uh, heterochromatin uh, repression. Uh, by contrast, the features that are the most active in these highly expressed genes uh, are either uh, H3K4 trimethylation, which is a promoter mark, H3K36 trimethylation, a transcribed gene body, and H3K4 monomethylation, which is an enhancer mark. And then some genes show more of an enhancer presence. These are the genes where the enhancers were sufficiently proximal to be within the 5,000 base pairs. And then for other genes, uh, these appear to be more distant, sorry, for other cell types, they appear to be more distant, where some of the enhancers utilized in those cell types appear to be possibly further away. Everybody with me so far? So this is basically using the same types of architectures that we've seen before, but now applied to the task of predicting gene expression le uh, levels through these uh, methods. Any questions? Nothing from the chat window. Everybody with me? Carry on. Sounds good. Cool. So um, this is basically now using uh, these histone uh, positional uh, information, uh, but um, you know, the question is, can we somehow improve this by being able to focus our attention on specific regions uh, at a time? So the same set of authors basically uh, then built uh, attentive chrome after dip chrome. And then what attentive chrome does is that it adds a layer of attention that basically allows the uh, deep learning model to selectively pay attention to different parts of the input based on the overall uh, prediction accuracy. So the idea here is very similar to what we saw before with the uh, LSTM long short term memory uh, module that allows to now not only decide what are the values that are coming in, but also decide whether I want to be, keep remembering this particular uh, value or not. So I don't know if you guys remember this, but in um, one of the early lectures of the course, as we were talking about sort of these uh, uh, recurrent neural networks, these RNNs, that could basically have thousands, of, thousands of sort of progressions along a linear sequence and therefore a very rapidly diminishing influence from the positions much earlier on. What we had at the time created was this LSTM module that allowed us to remember something by sort of setting a remember bit up and then remembering that something unattenuated for many, many cycles until we needed it and then decide to now actively forget it. Raise your hands if you remember that. Uh, architecture. Yeah, awesome. So what we're going to be basically doing now is coupling that architecture with deep chrome that we saw before to basically build a hierarchical nested set of LSTM modules that allows to capture interactions across marks and which marks are the most important at different places and which lines of evidence to pay attention as we go. And what you can see is this attention map that is basically telling us where am I focusing attention for repressive combinations of marks or structural combinations or enhancer combinations or promoter combinations. And these combinations are specifically paid attention to at different positions along the body of the gene. So that is basically allowing us to now group combinations and then light them up exactly in the locations where they become the most informative and again, all of that is learned de novo by coupling this convolutional uh, network with this LSTM uh, module. And what you can see is basically using this more complex architecture, 
you get this consistent improvement over the prone where uh, you know in each of these cases you basically see continued uh, increase uh, over the prone so out of 56 cell types in 50 cases this particular version of the model was in fact uh, performing better any questions so far okay so this is all about predicting expression from different combinations of features let's now turn to predicting splicing from sequence directly so splicing is uh, you know very complex it is extremely cell type specific and then the question is can we now learn what are all of the features that allow us to predict splicing the idea is the following you basically have uh, exons and introns for every gene. The exons are basically where the protein coding segments are, and the introns are the things that are spliced out that in the end do not result in a functional protein for that particular transcript. So you basically have RNA polymerase that sort of binds you know, at the promoter. It starts transcribing at the transcription start site. The first exon is typically, you know, starting with the untranslated region, a UTR, a, a non-coding portion that contains all kinds of regulatory signals, and then starts the ATG of the first uh, exon, and then you translate that ATG and the subsequent triplets into protein uh, coding sequence, and then eventually you run into these sort of non-coding uh, segments that you splice out prior to translating uh, the mature mRNA that has combined all that together. So the question is, can I predict which exons will be included in which uh, cell type? Because in, say, liver, you might end up with exon 1, uh, exon 2, exon 3 in order. But in brain, you might actually splice out exon 2, where basically the splicing machinery will connect, instead of this particular junction to that junction, it will connect this junction to that junction, effectively skipping exon 2. And that's extremely important in basically generating a very large diversity of potential proteins from a relatively small number of only 20,000 genes. So if we are trying to now predict the splicing code, if we're trying to predict what are the features that allow us to infer whether an exon is retained or an exon is skipped, we can basically ask where, where might this information be? This information might be in the flanking exons as additional non-coding signals that are encoded within the DNA sequence. They might actually be within the exon as additional, again, uh, nucleotide level signals that tell the splicing machinery how to treat this exon. And then very prominently, they can also be in the flanking uh, nucleotides surrounding these exons but also within the intermediate intron as well as other flanking uh, uh, sequence regions. So what we'd like to do now is use all of these deep learning technologies that we've learned about to systematically predict whether an exon will be included or excluded in a particular tissue. Raise your hands if you're with me on what the problem is trying to achieve. Yeah, awesome. So we basically have these 300 nucleotide intervals surrounding the exon. We have the flanking exons and we have the exon itself. And from these, we extract a large set of features. These features include known motifs, the structure of the transcript, how the RNA itself is folding into uh, you know, two dimensional uh, structures. And then uh, all of that in both the target exon and in the target uh, the adjacent age, uh, exons and within the flanking uh, introns. And then the goal is for every tissue type to basically predict what are the set of features and how do, what do they tell us about whether a particular exon will be included or not. So what we're trying to predict is the probability of inclusion, of exclusion, and so on and so forth. Okay. And then this was done uh, back in uh, 2010 uh, by a very prominent group in uh, Toronto. So the overall architecture is now to use these thousands of RNA features and then uh, thousands of uh, exons for which we're trying to predict those features and then have all of that feed into this neural network with a hidden layer and then output this multitask learning challenge of 
what are the inclusion exclusion parameters for every exon in several tissues. So in the central nervous system, in muscle, in embryo, in digestive tissues, and so on and so forth. So basically the number of hidden units for a Poisson statistic, the network weights, follow this spike and slab prior that basically has a very strong probability accumulated on sort of one value. And then uh, this slab that sort of flanks that spike with a lower uh, probability. And then the likelihood was cross entropy and then the network weights were sampled from the posterior distribution. So, um, you know, the goal was to now start predicting not only which genes will be spliced in what tissues, but also how will disease associated mutations change these splicing patterns? And are we allowed, uh, you know, does that allow us to now start predicting what will be the impact of genetic mutations in specific tissues? So the goal was to basically uh, train this uh, model, both for the overall splicing or alternatively for the difference between uh, splicing in the reference genome for the non-disease associated variant and then splicing in the alternate version for the disease associated variant. So basically for non-risk and risk or for reference alternate, what is the impact uh, of a particular mutation on splicing. And then you sort of feed both of those to your computational model, and then you can predict both what is the overall level of splicing, but also what is the change of splicing that's happening in the context of genetic variation to then predict a regulatory score for every SNP. So what the authors did was train the splicing code model on 10,000 exons to predict the three splicing classes over 16 human tissues using a very, very large uh, set of sequence features. And these include both motifs and RNA structures as we discussed. And they basically scored both the reference and the alternate sequences, harboring each of 700,000 common variants. And then they calculated this uh, difference in splicing for every tissue and then obtain the largest absolute or aggregate delta splicing to score the effects of individual SNPs. Everybody with me so far? Raise your hands if you're following. Awesome. Um, all right, so uh, what they found was that the predicted scores were actually very indicative of disease-causing mutations. That basically the uh, difference between variants and reference was uh, quite remarkable uh, in many, many places. So for the vast majority uh, of um, uh, exons, the uh, alternate and the reference did not cause a change in splicing, but for some of them, it caused a dramatic change in splicing, where when the reference was at 100% splicing, suddenly splicing was disrupted by the variant and then fell dramatically uh, lower. And this is basically where along the gene body those features were found and how um, predictive were these as you walked along the body of the gene. And that's where it gets really interesting. Remember how we basically said that we're looking at every exon, the flanking introns and the spacing, and we have all these 300 base pair windows. Uh, but the model is basically now asking, well, where did these features actually lie? And what you can see here is that these features are found, yes, throughout the intron and throughout the exon bodies, but they're very, very highly concentrated in the nucleotide sequences right before the exon starts. And that's where splice sites are known to reside. But in this particular case, this is looking at a much larger window surrounding these splice sites. So this is very interesting because it basically says that it's not just the splicing donor and splicing acceptor site that we've known about for a long time, but it's a very large number of additional sequences that can be you know, up to, I don't know, 20, 30 nucleotides upstream rather than just the five nucleotides flanking the uh, exons. It also says that there are a large number of exonic nucleotides that participate in this decision to splice or not um, a particular exon. And in particular, um, you see that uh, many synonymous uh, sites shown here in green are having an effect in splicing, 
even though traditionally they have been completely disregarded as unlikely to be disease causing by the research community because it's largely focusing on the protein coding uh, alterations. Everybody with me so far? So basically the strongest sites were right before the exon, right after the exon, and also within the exon itself, decreasing slightly as you go towards the inside of the exon, and then increasing slightly as you go towards the boundaries of these exons. So how did this, oh, we have a question. Uh, could you please go over figure B briefly? Yeah, so figure B is basically saying what is the overall frequency of uh, these, uh, you know, splicing scores for the variant and for the reference. And the reason why it is asymmetric, my guess, is that most of these variants are more likely to disrupt splicing than to um, create a new splice site. So basically, uh, you know, if you look at the space of sequences that could potentially disrupt a splice site, if you have one, it is very large, but the sequences that are gonna create a splice site, uh, you know, it's very, very small. So that's why there's very, very few points that are in the off diagonal, like that are above the diagonal and very many points that are below the diagonal. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's basically telling us, okay, got it, thanks, awesome. Um, cool, any other questions? Cool. So now we can basically ask, uh, great, this is where they're falling and that makes a lot of biological sense, but you know, are they previously annotated to be you know, uh, associated with disease? And what we can do is basically ask, well, for actually there's another chat question, how could this approach be used for the detection prediction of gene recombinations? Um, Yes, gene recombinations. I'm not sure exactly what you mean. Do you mean trans splicing, where basically one particular gene is binding to another uh, gene uh, further away? Um, yes. Um, so yeah, absolutely. You could predict that from this model. You could basically say, well, I'm predicting that this particular site is, you know, um, very important, and there isn't a corresponding site within this gene, but there's a you know, corresponding site in the other gene. So computationally, yeah, this could be informative as to what are the specific splice sites that are causing this trans splicing. But I think experimentally, the, the most direct way of observing that is to basically go after um, uh, sequence pairs of RNA sequencing that directly capture these events. Because what this tells you is what are the important nucleotides, but it doesn't tell you about the specific splicing uh, it only tells you about exon inclusion and exclusion, not the specific pairs that are being made. I hope this helps. Awesome. Um, so now we can basically start asking for different classes of nucleotide changes, how uh, is the model performing in discriminating those? And what you can see is that the score for uh, disease associated variants is actually uh, much higher than for non-disease associated variants. So basically uh, this difference between the red curve and uh, you know, the other curves is actually quite substantial. These are true genuinely confirmed nucleotide uh, causing mutations. But if you look at the overall performance for GWAS, you see a slightly, uh, you know, a small shift here in blue and a small shift here as well, where there's only a slight enrichment for being more associated with splicing um, if they have, uh, if they're implicated in GWAS because the vast majority of genetic variants associated with GWAS are along for the ride rather than causal. And we're gonna talk more about that when we get into the genetic section, but most of the, um, every time you have a disease association, you have an association between 20 nucleotides or 100 nucleotides and the disease, but these 20 nucleotides or 100 nucleotides are sitting in a single region and they're always co-inherited or not co-inherited. Basically, they're always inherited together or not at all. And that basically means that even if one of them disrupts splicing, the other 20 will all be associated. So that's the main reason why there's only a small blip here because the vast majority of 
genetic variants in these disease regions are not the causal one or the causal ones, but they're just along for the ride. And then the other reason is that not everything functions through, through splicing. Uh, but for those that are known to be disease associated, there's a dramatic enrichment. And again, if you look at whether they're causal, their scores are much, much larger, and whether there's in vitro or in vivo evidence, larger, when they're associated, and then if they're associated and functional, then there's a slight increase exactly as you would expect. What does regulatory score mean? The regulatory score is effectively this difference between the impact of a genetic variant on splicing versus the impact of the alternate on splicing. So this delta between those two is effectively the regulatory score. That answered your question. And then you can basically ask what are the specific mutations? Um, what are, you know, and where are they falling? Is there intronic variation, exonic variation? And look at individual gene examples and start asking what is the overall uh, performance in being able to detect those, not just in common variants, but now also in rare variants. So if you look at colorectal uh, cancer patients, these are somatic variants that are detected via RT-PCR. And then you can see that a large number of those appear to have effects uh, on splicing. So this was the initial model. It wasn't very deep at all. It was just a single layer. But uh, eventually, the, these authors basically created a much larger uh, set of layers, looking at many more combinations. And then this architecture allowed, us to, uh, allowed them to predict uh, alternative splicing between tissues. It contained multiple hidden layers, so three different hidden layers, with variables that jointly represented both genomic features and uh, tissue types. So there were, of course, some limitations. There was a required threshold to define these discrete splicing targets. It wasn't taking into account exon expression uh, levels, uh, simply binary uh, in inclusion exclusion probabilities. It was uh, the fully connected network could potentially impose a very, very large number of, number of parameters. So basically 13,000 parameters if you multiply it all out. And even though the authors show that the neural network performed the best in the soft plus to your multivariate linear regression, uh, you know, uh, they, they didn't try, you know, other models to basically show that whether they could achieve similar performance. And also the features, uh, all of these quote, quote unquote convolutional filters that we've been talking about were predefined. So they may actually not reflect the true underlying splicing mechanism. And I think an extension of that would be to learn both the architecture of the model and the combination of features, um, the, the specific motifs underlying the splicing. Uh, these convolutional filters, if you wish, on this one hot encoding of the sequence, uh, de novo as well. And also the interpretation of the importance of the features was not trivial given the thousands of features and parameters. So who's with me so far? Feeling like you're learning stuff? So basically what we uh, talked about is predicting expression initially by upsampling many genes from few genes, by co using combinations of these genes in composite measurements, by uh, predicting expression from chromatin directly or predicting splicing from sequence. This has all been, uh, we have a number that we're trying to predict and we're basically using a set of features to predict that number. But deep learning doesn't necessarily need to be supervised. So what I'd love to introduce you for the remaining 10 minutes or so is uh, unsupervised deep learning. So basically, how do we uh, build these multi-layer models uh, in absence of a specific um, goal, a specific output value that we're training with, and how we can use that to then learn uh, to integrate gene expression, DNA, and microRNA, um, DNA methylation, and microRNA values using this restricted Boltzmann machine uh, RDM approach. So, and we will apply that to a cancer data set to basically learn combinations of features that distinguish different patients. And then what we'll see is that these patients are in fact performing very, very differently from each other. But first of all, what are these restriction uh, Boltzmann machines? So everybody thinks of deep learning in this uh, supervised framework. So again, the intuition is that you have these um, neurons and you have these activation functions and you have these multi multiple layers and then you have this output function from these input units through these many layers and through all kinds of nonlinearities 
And then the way that we train it is through um, backpropagation and uh, gradient ascent and ultimately learning the set of ways that best predict the training data in this output using the testing data and the validation data to basically figure out how it will perform in new uh, places, okay? So these deep multi-layer neural networks can basically learn almost any function between an input X and an output Y. And that has been sort of most of what we've talked about um, in, in, in the class and also in the field. But then the question is, can we do deep unsupervised learning? Can we again use this sort of deep architecture without necessarily having any training data or any labeled data or any output function? So how do we do that? So this is actually dating back well before the modern wave of deep learning with general Boltzmann machines. And then the idea for that is unsupervised learning, where instead of having a set of visible units and a set of outputs, you just have a set of visible units and a set of hidden units in a symmetrically connected network. There's no target output. Every binary unit makes a stochastic on-off decision as to turn on or off. And the network weights basically learn the relationships between these variables and the configuration of the system di dictates the overall energy of these variables. So at equilibrium, it follows a Boltzmann distribution, basically this exponentiated negative energy, which gives these general Boltzmann machines their names. So these visible units, RV and these hidden units are H. So they're the hidden units and the visible units. And you basically have a set of energy uh, measurements that allow you to sort of infer the energy of the system, which is basically uh, coming from the state of those units and the bias of every unit, as well as the combination of units that are co-on and the weights of those. So if you look at this function, basically when both of the, when either of these are zero, this term doesn't matter, but when both of them are on, that's when you basically subtract energy uh, and you're trying to sort of basically minimize the energy of the whole system. And then the overall probability function of the system basically tells you what is the uh, overall energy given only the hidden units divided by the overall energy given both the visible and the hidden units to basically adjust for the fact that uh, you're making these observations. So uh, the goal is given these uh, visible units V, how do we learn a set of weights, Wij, to effectively minimize this energy dependent overall energy function of the system? And what's really cool is that this Boltzmann machine effectively becomes a very universal approximator of probability mass functions over these discrete variables. So the advantage is that there's only local learning rules and you're inferring every variable based on only the neighbors. And there's no need for example annotations and there's no output function. But the problem is that they're usually very difficult to train. And the reason is that there are actually dependencies even between the hidden units. So as I'm increasing this probability, you know, that one is changing as well. And then these are affecting each other dramatically. And that's sort of where in order to specifically combat this problem, these restricted Boltzmann machines came about rather than the general Boltzmann machines. So what are restricted Boltzmann machines? They're basically looking at um, only a bipartite graph where these red connections between visible units and these red connections between hidden units are no longer present, where you now have only connections between hidden and visible units. Is everybody with me so far? Yeah? So in this bipartite graph, there's no HH, no VV connections. There's only one layer of hidden units and one layer of visible units. And it's a very simple, unsupervised learning module. It's much easier to train than the general Boltzmann machine because there's no circularities. These hidden units are not affecting each other. So you can basically define your objective functions. You can uh, you know, uh, estimate these models either jointly, if their models are very small, or using Markov chain Monte Carlo, MCMC, or deep sampling um, if the models are larger. So you can then now go a step further. Instead of having only one set of hidden units that effectively depends directly on the input, you could actually have a stack of layers of these hidden units. And this is now starting to look like a deep neural network. Only 
the hidden units don't necessarily have um, uh, an output function. So you could basically build these multiple uh, layers. And then in the end, you could also tag on this uh, output layer after having trained this bolt put machine using only the hidden units with no output function. So you can actually use this network to generate uh, example sequences by basically looking at, uh, for example, applying this restricted bolt put machine on the whole set of uh, MNIST characters and then sampling from this generative model by clamping down the zero and then keeping you know, all the others uh, unclamped and so on and so forth, basically clamping each of the labels and then asking what is the machine seeing when this particular visible unit is one but all the other ones are zero. And then what it's learned is the set of hidden values that are activated for that. And you can project these values onto a bitmap and basically see what has the model learned. And what you can see here is that it is actually learning as you go through layers of iterations of training, it is actually learning these classes without actually having uh, an output function associated with them. Just by looking at the characters, it's able to sort of learn hidden units that completely distinguish between those. Everybody with me so far? Yeah? So we can now use these restricted Boltzmann machines, these RBMs, to basically carry out uh, multimodal learning. So how do we do that? We can basically use it to combine gene expression measurement, DNA methylation measurements, and microRNA measurements, uh, and carry out data integration using these uh, RBMs. So how do we do that? We can basically have this hierarchical model that is a stacked RBM, a, st a stacked restricted Boltzmann machine or a belief network. And you have these visible variables for gene expression, for DNA methylation, for microRNA expression, and then uh, propagate those up uh, the tree uh, without actually having any kind of output learning function, just by having this set of hidden variables interconnected. And this energy function is basically now combining the multiple data types. And you can sort of see what is the overall energy of these uh, different systems as, a, as the model progresses. And here you can basically see that the model is basically learning these six hidden units and their relationships with all of these hidden variables in a completely unsupervised way. What this is basically looking at is for each of these groups, what are the activation features of you know, these lower level variables and ultimately gene expression, DNA methylation and microRNA uh, regulation. And what's really cool is that uh, when you apply this model, it basically learns a set of classes, a set of groups based on these components which when you look at the uh, you know, particular cancer patients that showed gene expression levels, DNA methylation patterns, microRNA expressions in the different groups, according to the learned relationships of this model, they actually have very different uh, prediction trajectories as to what their uh, survival rates will be. So if the model predicted that you're in the blue category, you're in trouble because within, you know, uh, a few years, you'll die much more, uh, you're, you'll be much more likely to die. But if you're in this green category, you're much less likely to die. So this is basically <coughs> also correlating across the different models with a specific drug utilization of these patients. Basically saying, well, they, these expression patterns, DNA methylation patterns and microRNA expression patterns are actually en enabling me to predict either what is the impact of the drug or what was your state which then allowed the doctors to prescribe different types of drugs for you. Again, the causality between the two is not clear, but this could also be used as a recommendation system to basically say, hey, which patient should be taking you know, this drug or that drug, depending on which group you're in, you're much more likely to have been prescribed that drug. Okay, so what did we learn about? We looked at predicting gene expression and splicing. Uh, we reviewed the previous lecture of uh, expression and unsupervised learning in these clustering and TSNE plots and dimensionality reduction and embedding. Uh, 
We then looked at how we can upsample 1,000 genes to 20,000 genes, either from individual measurements or from comp composite measurements that more directly capture the modules. We looked at uh, how we can encode uh, features from chromatin that allows to predict gene expression and how we can encode memory for those models using these LSTMs in deep chrome and untouched chrome. We looked at how we can predict splicing from sequence, again, using these deep learning models with thousands of features and one layer or multiple layers, and how we can actually apply unsupervised deep learning using these deep belief networks or restricted Boltzmann machines that are stacked with layers of only visible units at the bottom, but then one or more layers of hidden units uh, above. And then lastly, we looked at how we can do multimodal learning by combining expression, DNA, and microRNA in the context of these uh, RBMs. Who feels that they've learned stuff today? Yes, good, awesome. Any last questions uh, before we close? All right, well, um, looking forward to the next online lecture on Thursday. And then, uh, you know, uh, this is probably how it's gonna be until the end of the term, as you've probably figured out already. Best of luck to all of you guys. Stay safe, stay with your families. Uh, don't go outside, don't spread this virus. Uh, and then, um, uh, take care of yourselves and enjoy uh, family time. This is actually uh, forcing us to look at what's important in life and uh, don't lose the opportunity to actually, you know, embrace your loved ones, uh, spend time on Skype and video calls with your friends. Uh, don't lose the human connection just because you're far from each other. All right, guys. Thank you so much. See you on Thursday. Bye-bye.